Hello and welcome to The Good Time Show. I'm your host, Damon Epps. Today we'll chat about Crystal Bridge's American Art Museum, an Alice Walton vision turned reality. This architectural masterpiece changed the game and has plenty of plans for the future. Let me introduce you to the once aspiring marine biologist now in charge of Crystal Bridges. So today on The Good Time Show, guys, we have a very special guest, Rod Bigelow, who is the director, give it to me. My title's actually executive director Ex and Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer. So Crystal Bridges is this incredible museum that got built 11 years ago. And I feel like COVID happened and now everything is taking off again. Mm -hmm. Tell me about, I guess, the... Um, well, tell me what Crystal Bridges is from your point of view. Crystal Bridges is so much. It is what we think about as a community center. We are an art museum for sure, but we're a community center where we invite people in and create experiences that involve art, nature, and architecture. So it is a place for gathering and experience and dialogue and learning and fun. How about that? Most people go to a museum to have fun. This is all about having fun. And this <laughs> town is all about having fun. How long have you lived in Bentonville? Well, when we moved here, I moved to Rogers. Okay. So I've been I've been living in Bentonville for probably five years now. Oh, five yeah. years. Yeah. But I've been in Northwest Arkansas for 13. Okay. So you've been, so Rogers, you were in Rogers 13 years ago. Yep. Got it. So you're still like, you know, been village. Yeah. We moved school. downtown you, you moved just down. to be part of the downtown. Downtown thing. Bentonville. I am yep. now downtown and is a crazy little experience. What was Bentonville like 13 years ago? Well, I really love hearing the stories of the, what I call old timers. Um, but when I came here, there were two restaurants downtown um, that barely maybe were kind of called restaurants. Um, it was just kind of a wonderful but sleepy town and the home of Walmart and lots of vendors. And, you know, how I knew uh, Bentonville was I was part of DBI, downtown Bentonville Inc., okay. on the board for a while and trying to activate, like, Daniel Hintz was working so hard to activate downtown, get people to come downtown, be part of what a possible future would look like. And so it was just that like trudge of trying to get people to be, feel comfortable in downtown. And then it sort of just exploded. I think Crystal Bridges was certainly a catalyst in part of that. But the city really rolled out the carpet preparing for the opening of the museum and it all kind of took, took flame. Yeah. So you've been part of Crystal Bridges since the very big from almost inception or well about a year from when we opened so the idea really came from alice and the family earlier than that 2004 2005 2006 and we didn't open until 2011 so that the process of dreaming up this idea and actually building and installing a collection took several years so i, I came about a year before we were open I'm sure you have the story of like can you tell me like the story of like what alice was thinking yeah. when all of this came to be and then we can get into the details of like you bet. how big all this stuff is. So, you know, Alice um, never grew up with art in Northwest Arkansas. She There was not a museum here and she grew up here and had the opportunity to, to travel, go to places like Oklahoma or Kansas City. Uh, but she knew that deep down she wanted to create access for art um, for this community because art was such an important part of her life. She made art with her mother she found a therapeutic through her life. She started to collect art. Um, she started actually collecting watercolors. And uh, pretty soon she thought, she discovered watercolors could be kind of expensive. So she, she thought she should learn more about it. So she would start reading books and learning about art and, and everything that she learned. Basically, she would pick up an artist, she would read about them, and then she would collect them and sort of learned art history and American history, really, through the eyes of artists and through this idea of learning and collecting art. And so she started to do that, started, actually started in the 80s of collecting art without any ambition to start a, to create a museum and collected and collected and just became very passionate about it and, and very connected to it. Um, and then later on in this 2004 timeline and probably before that, mm -hmm. she started thinking about how do I make a difference with the, the gifts that I have? Right. Um, I was about to say you're with the amount of wealth that just happened. Yeah, I mean, Walmart. she just it's had amazing. the privilege of yep. being able to do that and trying to change the lives of children and families in this community became a passion of hers. And so she decided to, with her family and with the foundation, to dedicate funds to create a museum here. And, you know, it's a crazy story because people think, 
why would you ever start a museum in Northwest Arkansas? Like, it's not really a thing. And, it's not really a thing. But it it was a vision and is a vision still. I find all this fascinating, right? Like the family obviously came from, it was like a tiny little, I love the the little museum that's in downtown. The like, Walmart museum. I think it yeah. was that. And now yeah. it's <laughs> these massive buildings all over the United States that kind of exploded. Um, and obviously that, the gifts as you will, like have come, but like what goes through someone's mind when you're going to build a, they didn't just build a museum. <laughs> like it wasn't like, oh, we're just going to build like a little art, like <laughs> studio or whatever. It's massive. What Alice wanted to do was create a different kind of experience from an art museum perspective. And that when I started with telling you this is a community center, that's what her mind was really thinking. How do we invite people in here and overcome some of those barriers of going to a museum? Like, are you an art history major? I am not. Did you have art history in high school? I did. I was a special ed kid, right? Okay. So, um, <laughs> so you, you got know, other kinds I of privileges. I really learned how to talk. And yes, <laughs> I, I, but a lot of teachers liked me because I was a really nice kid, but I was not, you know, they, they, I got through school. Yeah. How but about yes. college? Did you have art history? Or I art did. Class? I had art history. Well, I was a, I was a theater major and okay. I was also um, a film major uh, when I realized okay, how dumb so you it are, was. Yeah. So you're made to come to a museum, right? Yes. I, I do love art and I do, I've learned to respect it yeah. as I've gotten older and yes. So most of us in the world don't have that experience with art. Like I had one art history class in college. I think I had, I had photography in high school, maybe one class. But most people feel very intimidated by the idea of coming into a museum, having to like be tested when you come into a museum. Like, I need to understand all those works of art, especially when you get into contemporary art or abstract art. You're like, what is this stuff? How do I understand what this is? Like, and it feels a little intimidating. So Alice's idea was to remove all those barriers, try to create a space that was connected with nature because we most of us feel more comfortable in nature. Um, at least if you didn't grow up in a city, maybe maybe right. that's different, but. Yep. Um, so it's about this connection between art, nature, and architecture, and those things um, really creating a building, a facility, a space that embraced that. And instead of climbing up the steps to what we all think about a neoclassical, if you close your eyes and think about what a museum is, it's climbing up those stairs, and there's columns, and you open this big door, and you go through, mm -hmm. and there's this big like stone building. She flipped the narrative, and her working with Moshe Safdie, the architect, wanted okay, to create- give me who that is. Oh, right. Moshe Safdie. Okay, let's go into Moshe Softy. Okay, Moshe is uh, what a great name is the. Uh, well, he probably we we express his name in lots of different ways, and I'm sure I'm mangling it, but I call him Moshe Softy. Mm -hmm. um, so he uh, is a tri citizen. He's an architect um, that's um, Canadian, uh, U.S. citizen, and um, uh, Israeli. And he uh, is an architect that's based in Cambridge and has done lots of museum projects around the world. Uh, he did the Singapore airport. I don't know if you've seen, um, if you go to Singapore and there's this three columned, like it. looks like a ship on top with a yes. pool that has yep. endless, looks like you're mm -hmm. That's him. Wow. So um, he's a phenomenal, brilliant guy who um, started his career at 25 years old on the cover of Time magazine by doing what's called Habitat 67 in Canada, trying to reinvent the way in which people exist in the world through uh, density of housing, but connection to nature. So sorry, I went too far. In no, that. not, not at all. I actually love diving into that because there was, a, and I, I don't know when we're going to talk about it and we could talk about it now, but there was, I was telling him something. I, I was, I actually helped out on that Meg Ryan movie. Oh yeah. And so we were all shooting nights and you were yeah, yeah. making the whole Crystal Bridges look like an airport, yes. which is also kind of funny. You know, like when you see the movie, you're going to be like, oh, yeah. like, oh, that's the airport. No, that's actually a multi-billion dollar museum. Um, but when we were outside, you know, all of a sudden I was outside and, you know, working away, trying to stay out of the thing. And all of a sudden four skunks just start walking up to me and, <laughs> um, you know, and they were so friendly. They just kept walking up. But that said, like there is a big, obviously the, the wildlife is something you're not trying to get rid of. You, oh, like, no. The wildlife is part of. Well, there's some Part snakes that we don't love, but right. <laughs> I'm with you on that one. So, so anyway, sorry. Moshe and Alice flip this narrative of instead of climbing up these steps into this big, maybe intimidating space that you would descend in the space when you arrive at Crystal Bridges, you don't. You're like, I can't really see a building. You see a little colonnade, but you don't really see this big, massive building until you start to enter and come down into it. So it's about receiving people into a space that feels much more comfortable in a way. But then you see the, the monumental scale of what it is. It's a 200,000 square foot building that's actually seven, depending on how you count them, nine, seven or nine separate buildings that are connected through these spaces that connect with nature. 
and there's a literally a river that runs through the middle of it. So the idea of like the audacity of building an art museum over, over water, not the most recommended idea, um, but it works. It works because the engineering of the space is just incredibly phenomenal uh, and kind of leans to the name of Crystal Bridges. So the idea is that these bridges physically cross this waterway. So Moshe was inspired not only by the name, but also by the family house. And the family house actually from Bay Jones design has a part of the house that expands over the same waterway. So he brought those ideas. Um, Wait, I'm confused through, on that part. What do you mean? Sorry. So like, no, don't be, don't be sorry. <laughs> so There's e. no Jones, sorries here. E. Faye Jones is an architect that's from um, Arkansas. Okay, got it. And uh, the Faye Jones School of Architecture is named after him. Uh, and he was, uh, he studied under Franklin Wright. So Got there's it. a lineage here that Ife Jones actually designed the family home. And that family home has a bridge that expands over the same waterway that Crystal Bridges is built on. Oh, got it. On Sorry, down so the way. making that connection all the way through. So got it. Softy was inspired by that original design and built the bridges across the waterway for Crystal Bridges. And why is it called Crystal Bridges? Because if you come to the space and you, as you enter into what we call the south entrance, the furthest entrance toward okay. downtown Bentonville, um, there's a pond called Crystal Pond, and that Crystal Pond is fed by Crystal Spring. That Crystal Spring is an amazing thing. If you haven't done this, you should go, like, walk around Crystal Pond, and you literally see water just spilling out from under the earth. There's you can't see the source; it just comes out from this massive rock and it just pours and pours water coming into the pond and then supports the waterway that goes through. We've actually tested the water and the water's actually cleaner, <laughs> more pure than the water that we have in the museum. <laughs> so, <laughs> not that I would say run out and drink water out of the, out of the <laughs> pond or the, the spring, but it is perfectly natural, beautiful water. And so Crystal Springs fed the idea of Crystal Bridges. So that's where the name comes from. That's very cool. I always love it. Sometimes it's always the names. Yeah. Are, and bridges are obviously physical, but also metaphorical. So Yeah. Uh, bringing people together. Bridging, bringing communities. communities. Mm, inclusion. Yep. You can go all the way. <laughs> all the way. We can have all the artsy talks we that's want. That's right. That's right. Um, there's two things about Crystal Bridges that was fun for me when I walked in. Like, I guess the one piece of art that I kind of was drawn to is happens to be the piece of art. I think that was like the $57 million piece of art that, that what, which one are you thinking about? I know it's like, <laughs> I, you throw out 50, it's like, what, which $50 million piece of art are we talking about? Uh, what? <laughs> I don't know. I think what it, did was it like, look like uh, there was, it was like, um, a guy, like two little guys on a cliff. And oh it's like yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's called kindred spirits kindred by spirits. Asher B. Durand. Yeah. So this this is the sort of iconic object of the museum. It's sort of that if you haven't seen it, it is um, a scene of a landscape um, and it is actually in New England, uh, upstate New York. I think if I've got these facts right. And you've got two individuals that are in front sort of connecting. Um, um, and this is the work that really exposed the idea of that a museum was being built. And uh, it was there was a sale of the object f from a New York institution. People in New York got a little upset that it was moving from New York to okay. Arkansas and no one would look at it. No one would care about the work in Arkansas because, because that's it's better in New York. Yeah. Um, so that hit the papers and that's kind of when we had to say, yes, we're building a museum in Northwest Arkansas and yes, people are going to come see it. So. Oh, got it. So before that, nobody knew. It, it was already in the works that a museum was coming. But no one knew that. But no one knew that. Yeah. People just thought Alice was going to put this picture in her house, her, in her house yeah. and ride over and have some breakfast and yep. be like, oh, my eggs look great right now. Yep. Yep. Um, but they're always the plan was to put it in a museum. and Exactly. That. So that prompted sort of the publicity around the museum happening. A little bit of that, too, of like one thing that interests me. So one museum that I was fascinated with or was when the Getty Museum got built in LA mm -hmm. and I would walk around there and it's, you know, it's, it's super, there's a lot of Catholic stuff and, you know, with it's really religious based, I think most of it. But the thing that blew me away was that John Getty owned it all. I mean, it was like an individual that owned it all. And I guess that's kind of how art works. I guess when you break it all down, somebody ends up owning all. 
Alice owns a lot of the artwork. Is that correct? Or is like... She's given um, m- nearly all the work that she has to the museum, and she's promised the remainder. So all the work that she has collected will go to the museum for the public's benefit. It's so crazy. Yeah. I want to ask you what what drew you to Kindred Spirits. I don't know. I really don't know. Like, I, you know, <laughs> to be honest, we walked in, and we had, like, a tour guide that was, like, you know, all of a sudden, he was just too much. Uh, but he was something else. <laughs> he was enjoying know. it. He was just enjoying it. All of a sudden, I was like, okay, Aaron, we're going to have to, you know, it was, like, first, I was like, yeah, he chose around. All of a sudden, I felt like, well, I was like, you know, I feel like he might come to dinner if we keep <laughs> hanging out with him. And he was a really great guy. But he kind of was bouncing around, and... um I don't know. We it was it was. I don't really know why I, I was, but I I and the and I and I read later that story. But I was yeah. walking around. and I just got with Aaron, and I looked at it, and I was like, I mean, I'm not the art guy. I'm Damon Epps, and you know, there's a lot yeah. of things I can tell you, but I'm not a guy that's going to speak eloquently about art. Yeah, and you, um, that's the great part is that you don't have to. Yeah, the rule. There are no rules when it comes to it, other than you can't touch the art. <laughs> like, well, that's what it's that, that is a rule. Uh, it doesn't um, say, you know, don't do well with it. But you don't <laughs> have to. You don't, you don't have to come knowing everything about the artwork. It's about what you see. Like, everyone brings their own experience, their own life experience to an observation and, and looking at a work of art. So it's okay. You don't have to. Yeah, I think, and to know that was part of America also is super interesting. Okay. I mean, I, I guess I just now have realized it is American art. So a lot of it has to do with America and all that. It's, it, it is um, Crystal Bridges Museum of American like Art. Like I said, I'm a special ed kid. I, I get, once I get too long in the sentence, I kind of cut it off and let's just talk through it. Like, just <laughs> let's work this thing out. Um, but when I when I was, I was looking at it, I just think I thought it was really beautiful and just yeah. the landscape and just kind of like, where is this place in the world? But to know it's like in New England, which drives me crazy because, you know, my buddy's from Boston and there's all well, that. So, technically, you know. it's a fictional place. Okay, good. It's not okay, a real place. There's no it's way. Sort of this, but it also looks like um, Hawksbill Creek. Hawksbill Craig. What does he call it? <laughs> I think that's right. <laughs> I think. <laughs> I, don't, I don't quite always get my, um, like, I understand the Washita Mountains mm-hmm. now. I didn't quite pronounce that right. Where are you I from? Was, I'm from I'm from Washington State. So you were from Washington State. Yeah. And the executive director of Crystal Bridges. What is actually that job? What is my job? Yeah. What is the <laughs> job of what? Because I know you obviously. I mean, you run the ship. I mean, you're. It's kind well. Of like, it is a big team, and um, so my job is really about trying to achieve the mission of the institution and achieve. Okay. I, I serve uh, as. Um, the board of the museum, so the board of directors, like other nonprofits, is the uh, organization, the part of the museum that sets the mission and vision and the major strategic efforts of the of the organization. And my job is to fulfill that, to work with the teams in every aspect of what we're doing, to work toward um, accomplishing all the things that we want to do over the over the lifetime of the museum. So, especially during this foundational time, it's really about translating Alice's vision into reality and establishing that foundation forever. You're part of the buying of the art, right? You're part of the... I work with all the teams to accomplish all the things, but all the experts sort of sit in other spaces. So like we have a chief curator with a team of curators that are experts at identifying great art um, and interpreting that great art. We have an exhibitions team and an interpretation team. We have a fundraising team because that's part of what we do as well. We, We rely on funds that come to the museum to make us work. We have a learning and engagement team. So we have all these teams that are working, trails and grounds, all these teams trying to come together to create these great experiences for folks. So my job is to help lead those teams in a, in everybody in the same direction, working on the same thing. But inclusion is a big part of what we do because we want to live true to that idea of welcoming all as a mission. And that means creating a place where people feel like they belong, that what we do is relevant to their lives. And so... If you uh, aren't an inclusive organization and you don't have inclusive programming, that doesn't work. It's not gonna, you're not going to be successful. So our job is to work very hard to figure out how do we provide experiences that relate. The inclusion stuff is really interesting to me because I see the effort that this town is actually making to include people. I mean, just by nature, Bentonville and, and Arkansas, it's yeah. a, lot of, a lot of white people. Just yeah, yeah. People. Um, and... I can see the effort when it comes to when you say inclusion, like, you know, I, I've lived in Hollywood for 25 years. And like, you know, when it comes to like, you know, gay people or, you know, other cultures, you're kind of inundated with it, you know, when you live in the middle of a city and, you know, you come to these little towns and this is a little town turned big city <laughs> is fat. I don't even know if there's another place on earth that kind of 
is like what it what this place is. Mm -hmm. And um I, I, I'm blown away on how much effort has been put into the LGBTQ community. It seems like you guys are really putting an effort to make African Americans feel included in this town. Um, is that a difficult process? Like how how has that process been for you in in this in this trying to build this community? When the museum first opened, um, there was a discussion about should there be an admission fee or not. And luckily, Walmart stepped forward and said, we want to fund and sponsor admission. So the very first step of changing the whole narrative about who comes to the museum, who doesn't, is to remove the cost of admission. So that's a huge deal. It changes what we do every day. Right. So whenever you walk in the museum, it is totally free. free. Yes. So that is the, trying to remove financial barriers is a, is a big effort. And no. we, we also have low cost or free program. Like we have 50,000 school children come to the museum every every year. And that is 100% free. So it pays for buses, it pays for curriculum development, substitute teachers, and what they love the most, lunch. <laughs> so all that is free. So when we think about... And those, that's just picked up by Walmart and the... Uh, that is actually funded by the Walker Foundation. The Walker Foundation. So the Walker Foundation has given okay. us an endowment to support the school tour program. Oh, very cool. So um, these are uh, barriers that exist across Northwest Arkansas and beyond and so removing those kinds of cost barriers is really important the other thing is we want to make sure that when you walk into the galleries that you actually see yourself or see your community in the spaces and if you don't see your community guess what it doesn't feel like you belong very well right so making sure that we are collecting objects and showing objects that have an expansive view of um, america and tell stories oftentimes some of those stories are just not told like if we think about our collecting our new collecting effort around collecting craft, which you alluded to earlier. Right. These are stories that are usually um, related to women. Like women have been making craft in exceptional ways for years, but have not been recognized for that artistic ability as much as sort of men have. And th those who go through school to actually become artists, trained artists in different ways. Um, and so elevating the idea of craft is as important as any other kind of art form and putting them together side by side and having a dialogue about them and telling the story of the maker is really, really crucial. So those are some basic things that we do to, to do that. Then we also have programming that reaches across the horizon. So we're programming in Springdale, we're programming here, we're programming in Rogers, communities across Northwest Arkansas. What do you mean by programming? What do you Meaning mean? Meaning like, like we have, um, what do we call it? An art truck in a way. We have a mobile art lab. Okay. So that mar mobile art lab takes programming, meaning sometimes it's art making, sometimes it's music. We often invite artists to be part of it, community members that are uh, engaged in uh, creating experiences that are in a town that's further away. And so those, we sort of land in a space, oftentimes at a library space, and engage with the community to connect with us, uh, build more community and belonging and understanding of what Crystal Bridges is. And then oftentimes we invite them back. We always invite them back. Oftentimes they come back to the museum space to um, see what we are and what we're about. So it's programming that is inclusive. Like we have um, dances in uh, the Great Hall. We have everything from jazz to um, Latinx music. We have orchestra music. We have a whole range of things that yeah, are happening crazy. across the museum. So the it bands, just, the yeah, forest stuff, happening all of us, the... everything happening outdoors. Yes. We have a summer concert series that is filled with a wide range of different kinds of performers. So yeah, it's about making sure that we have relevance. I was talking to your assistant. I definitely want to hear about this because inclusion, it's like, okay, we want to make sure you see the, but you guys really make an effort. Like, you know, I, I didn't even think about it until she said it about like blind people and yeah. like people with sensory um, sensory issues that like, like, well, I'll let you speak to it, but she, yeah. you know, people that have sensory issues, like it can't be out in public and things like that. You have tours at night. Exactly. You yes. So we have a program where, so the, I love the idea where people have different abilities of sight, where we have a team that actually creates touchable objects that are based on the artwork. And so you can feel the different textures and identify the object. You're not touching the object itself. Sometimes you can touch sculptures. You can put on gloves we arrange that to happen and people can touch and feel the the sculpture. But most of the time it's these 
amazingly textured objects that reflect the object on the wall. So that's a really cool thing. There are also many, many people that are colorblind and we still want to invite them to the museum. And there is actually technology where if you're colorblind, you can put on these glasses that we provide free. You can just check them out and it totally transforms the way in people, the way in which color line people see the objects. And we had a funder come forward and, and fund those glasses for us. So it's those kinds of things to think about. And the sensory, um, sensory sensitive folks that we have also are invited to come to one of uh, the evenings that we have that kind of dims the lights more, reduces the programming. So it's more quiet. We even down, turn down the sound on some of the installations, like in our temporary exhibition space. So Yes, we are trying to make sure that we are uh, inclusive and welcoming to everyone across the board. And being inclusive and being welcoming to all people and also I can only imagine how difficult this is. Um, mm -hmm. Art is something that is, it's just out there, right? So like I had a friend, I had a friend to come in town and I, I don't want to talk about the momentary yet. We can get to yep, the momentary, okay. but like- <laughs> Art is something that like, it's not here to please you. You know what I mean? Like, I remember that like when I first was like, I don't like that. And like, you know, so, <laughs> and this is, you know, we're, we're, we're in a place where, you know, people have strict values and, you know, there's different things, but you walk in that museum, there's definitely things that people won't agree with. I mean, sure. there's, we can get in the constitution stuff, but there's that one thing where all the, the um, nails in it. The, oh yeah. There's all of that. <laughs> So my friend went to the momentary and there's that video that's playing uh -huh. and it says, this is not America. And oh, it's yeah. like, it spins in a wheel and yeah. America. And then it shows North America and, you know, South America. And, you know, it's basically, in my opinion, when I do, I was like, oh, it's, let's, you know, I don't know why you're making a big deal. It's just saying that like, hey guys, let's, we're trying to include all people. So don't just be, don't try to make borders. This is what I took out of it. And I was yeah. like, it's, don't try to make borders. And yeah. like, just don't be a jerk and like, don't make such a big deal of it. She, you know, they, they, they were very strict military and like, you should only blah, blah, blah. And then I looked at her and I go, I go, look, I, I go, look, I'm no, I'm just Damon Epps, but I go, did it upset you? And she goes, yeah. And I go, well, what if that was the artist's mission? And she was like, well, why would somebody do that? And I go, I don't know. I'm not the artist, but like you're being affected by something. So I'm sure you like, I'm sure you feel it's a field day with you guys. Cause there, there is nude paintings in there and there, you know, there's, there's, there's all kinds of different types of art. Sure. Um, and ed I'm going to throw a lot of things at you because there's a lot educating people on, just like you said, like I didn't come from anything. I was just Damon Epps. And then I thought it was funny. So I got into theater. I was not like the, Hey, I'm, you know, blah, blah, blah. I wasn't doing musicals and stuff. Yeah. I just thought I wanted to do a stand up comedy. I got into theater. And so <laughs> I was not like the art guy. Um, but as I got into other things and I educated myself and all that, I have walked through Crystal Bridges and I have seen somebody for sure touch a $50 million piece of art with their hands. And I was like, oh my God, that is so crazy. <laughs> so there is an education too of like teaching people what art is. And I want to get your point of view on what that means to you and what it means to this community. But also somebody was telling me back in the day of um, that it, when you guys first did all the museums, there was like barriers where you couldn't walk right. up to the art yeah. and all of that. Mm. I'm assuming Alice or somebody was like, no, I don't want that. It makes it feel like whatever. And they just removed it all. And now people just walk and be like, I think it's pretty. <laughs> and they just put their hands on the piece of art. How do you deal with all this? Let's just make sure that uh, the artwork that you're talking about, the um, the, the American yes. work, is the artist Alfredo Jarm. Okay. And he presented this work on Times Square, in Times Square in the 80s. And he was definitely talking about how do you think about America? Like, are we Americas? Are we America? Is this United States? Who owns that narrative? And how can we think about us coming together? But I think the greater point is the work that we do. The work that we do is artists have a point of view, period. All artists have a point of view. And um, the way that we collect is to collect um, sort of uh, in a way that stretches you. It doesn't we don't try to have a point of view. We collect artists that talk about American perspective. And that um, idea is that you may walk through and you may find a work that you just completely relate to and you love and it makes you feel calm and relaxed. And there might be the next object that you might be jarred by. You may I think, think it happened. Why, why is that there? Like, why would someone do that? And those ideas are to provoke conversation. And hopefully they do. Hopefully you are maybe there with someone or you, you're having a conversation with me about an object like right now. Like, so let's talk about this. Like 
you were doing it with your friend who is, does that offend you? Yes. Why? Why does it offend you? Right. So all of our educators are actually trained very carefully to ask questions. Like, why do you, what do you see? What, why do you say that? What do you see that makes you say that? What of your experience do you think you've had that brings that to the forefront in your thinking? What about another person? What if they grew up somewhere else? Those, these are all opportunities for us to have a dialogue. So for us, it's really about how do we ask great questions? How do we present artworks that are asking great questions or presenting points of view that may be different and that may take you? So we, we have this little saying called discover, dream, do. Mm-hmm. And so the first idea is to, to make a discovery, to see something you haven't seen before, like out of your norm, pushes you in a way that pushes you to more beauty, pushes you to more challenge, more, I mean, think about the economy, whatever you want to, whatever it may evoke from you. So the second place is dream. Like how might you take that information and dream about what's the possibility or what could be different or how would I respond to that? Or do I need to go take that? Why I was mad and go do something about that. And that's the third thing is the do. Like, what do you want to do with that? Do you want to, most people don't come in and like instantly change into an artist, but a lot of people walk in and want to have a conversation about it. And so where do you take that inspiration and that dialogue and those questions and delve into it in your personal life, individually, with your family or with your community? So the idea for us is to really about asking great questions, creating, bringing great art into the space where artists are really doing an amazing job, both technically and uh, emotionally and, you know, from a very, very different perspective. So that's the idea. That's what we try to do mm-hmm. as an institution. And and we do exhibitions on a temporary basis to sort of engage people in different ways, thinking about things that may not be in our collection or contemporary subjects. So we did a great project called the Border Cantos Project, was really looking at the border between Mexico okay. and the U.S. And it really was trying to humanize that conversation. So some of the objects in there were backpacks from kids that were crossing the border that were left behind conversation from um, border patrol agents that were um, talking about what is their perspective and mm-hmm. some of the objects that they had like targets that you shoot um, the remnants of what that is and how does oh. that feel like like I'm literally having target practice on this border because I'm supposed to uphold the laws of the US so right there this idea of bringing people into a space where it's a very contentious topic if we can humanize that talk of topic and have a dialogue with each other about it, then it brings more of a sense of reality and, and to what that is. So those kinds of experiences are what we're really trying about to achieve. Was there a specific moment in your life where art started affecting you? Do you remember like the point which uh, you always been into art? No, you no. said you weren't into art. What did you want to be? A marine biologist. <laughs> My first two years of college were dedicated to marine biology and science. What, um, your, what kind of? And then I hit calculus. And, <laughs> and then it was all over. <laughs> yeah, Brother, I, I went to. I had a lot of dreams. <laughs> they got all killed, and they were like, "Damon, maybe, yeah. maybe you can be funny." <laughs> and then not right for you. For yeah, reality TV. Um, so yeah, so then. Uh, I have a business degree and, and my well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Before we get any further, like what were you, what was your emphasis in marine biology? Like what? There's a lot of, marine I didn't animals. get far enough to oh, get you didn't. There. You were just like, whatever. You just like, I like water species. Hit, yeah. Just wanted to work okay, good deal. Okay, on the I'm beach, in the water, yeah, whatever. You know what yeah. I mean? Just, just no. rod with a speedo in the ocean. That's all. <laughs> that's the vision that. that I just saw. Sorry, Rod. I apologize. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, uh, no, so there, so, I think (laughs) the moments that I have are really about seeing people that have experiences with art that change their lives. I was going to say, because that, you know, with, with, I do a lot of ridiculous shows and there's a lot of things, but when you have an effect on someone, like I do a lot of these interviews and, you know, behind the scenes when we're doing even stupid dating shows or all this kind of stuff, I really have these really wonderful bonds with people. Yeah. And it's always wonderful when you can open someone's mind and when like they came from a different world and you know, people are just people. And I, mm-hmm. I have this love for humans. I, I really, it's the reason why I'm doing this or it's not <laughs> like I'm getting paid or there's no <laughs> other reason for me to do this. Except it's true. For, I really love <laughs> to tell people stories and I love to meet interesting people. I just want to tell people stories. So when you, when you find someone that has never witnessed anything and then they have like a roadblock and then they kind of don't want to change or they don't want to, feel differently and then something happens whether it, you know it could be a piece of art or it could be anything or life tragedy or whatever but once once that happens it changes you forever but to see the beauty of like 
you know, there's tragedy in the world, but like to see a beautiful moment happen from something, it's cool to see people change. And I assume that happens a lot at Crystal Bridges. It does. The, you have articulated exactly why I do this work. And I think why most of us who work at the museum do this work, because it is an inspirational moment. And oftentimes those necessarily don't happen at the museum, but they happen post museum visit. Um, and then we get these letters that are like, I, I changed my life. I did this or that, or I reconnected with my parents or whatever it might be. Um, because that is, that is just something that's a, thing of beauty no question i i think it's really important to invest in well brian stevenson i don't know if you know who brian stevenson is but brian stevenson says get proximate to the issue so meaning in my world it means if if there's a work of art that i just don't understand or i don't like i need to spend more time with it i need to invest my time to really think about it more to like take a second look Um, and so that's about getting proximate to me. So, uh, I get the privilege of having, um, a work of art in my office, which is not really fair, but I get to do it. (laughs) And so often what I, what I've asked to have there, um, when I get to have it is something that I just don't like. And I learn about it. I investigate it. I talk to other people about it. I invite people to give me their perspective and it brings the work of art to life in such a different way. So I would encourage people to spend more time with things they Super don't like. So you legitimately request a piece of art that you hate. Yes. To be in your office. Yes. I'll tell you about this other experience that I have, and I should okay. I encourage you to do it, um, is come together as a group, um, um, whether that's a family group or a work group or whatever, and <laughs> I'm going to tell you to stand in front, of an, in front of one of the objects for an hour. <laughs> I love the look that you just had. <laughs> My attention span. <laughs> the reason why I am good at talking because I am like I consider ADHD a gift. I am not, not the person. I am like a maniac. Um, but I'm gonna so do it for you. I, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna sit there. You know what? I'm gonna film the whole thing. I'm just gonna David. film me staring. Okay, okay go so, for it. Okay, sorry. To it. We're gonna so get they, some B-roll of you standing in front of somebody yeah. for an hour. <laughs> so it's gonna I, be the cutaway to this thing. Our learning and engagement team um, asked me to do this several years ago, and I did exactly what you just did. I said, "There is no way I have enough patience to stand in front of an ad- object for an hour. It's not gonna happen." And I sort of delayed it and deferred it and all this stuff. It's fine. Like, fine, I'll do that. And I'll do that with the team and, and we'll go there and we'll do this. So we had a great facilitator, one of our team members that had all of us start to talk about. And so we all sat, sat and stood around this painting. Like one of those movies where everybody's sitting on the little, right. Exactly. And, um, you always wonder what they're doing. Yeah. Asked people to reflect on it. What do you see? And people will, it's, completely shocking to hear what other people see in a painting. Mm. Uh, And you're like, boy, boy, I don't see that. What are you talking about? That's not there. And then they'll talk about it more. And it's just amazing to see how different and how similar we are when we come to those spaces. And then like halfway through you move, you switch to the other side and you're like, whoa, this is a totally different object. It's a totally different painting. I see something completely different. And then you have a conversation about that. Oftentimes, this just sort of creates this bond between the, the group that's looking at it because you understand perspective, you, he- you hear experience, you start to identify how people relate or don't and understand who they are. It's a, it's a totally fascinating thing. So, <laughs> Okay, Ron. I'm, I'm emailing you. And Maybe you're gonna... we can start with half an hour. No, I'll do an hour. I'll do an hour. I'll somehow I'll figure it out. I got time right now. Um, I'll do an hour, but you got to tell me which one that you think I should do. Okay, I, I'll give you that. Um, the Constitution, I don't know if it's considered art. I, how is the, I guess, the, I mean, I, yeah, you want to describe, like, how is the Constitution? Because the Constitution is now... In the building. The, yeah, there's a couple <laughs> of things that I, I find fascinating, too, of, like, I know nothing about this, but, man, getting art across the country when there's $50 million in the thing, there's got to be some secrets going on. And like, <laughs> yeah, and I can't tell anybody. You can't <laughs> tell anybody. Like, I'm not, but, like... There's like a whole thing like you're you're it's a part of like the Constitution is in Crystal Bridges, yeah. right? Like yeah. the whole thing, the dudes signatures, all the guys. Yeah. I mean, um, one of the things that we think is important is also contextualize uh, the American experience. And part of that is obviously about 
history and history documents and things like that. Um, and I'll tell you, like the Constitution isn't the most; it is a an incredibly symbolic object, um, and it's shocking to think about something that's been here like whatever two hundred and fifty years, mm-hmm. and um, it still exists. Uh, and but it's kind of like when you look at it. Kind of boring. <laughs> I tell you the perfect honest real. answer. <laughs> it is a print, the, the the original print copy, uh, the first edition print copy of the Constitution. And there's a debate whether there are 11 or 13 that are still in the, in existence. But really, like this is the way in which they communicated to the colonies that we have a Constitution, the states. And so it is shocking to imagine that it's sitting there in the museum and it's still in such good shape. But what we want to do is contextualize How that. How did they get it from place to place? Just by horseback? So, uh, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know how they actually <laughs> move. Like, how it. do they do that? Pony oh Express. USPS. The USPS. <laughs> I would have just FedExed it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Why they took all this time? I don't know. I have to uh, research that one. Um, <laughs> but okay. there are these great documents. Um, there is the 13th amendment and the emancipation proclamation that are literally signed by Abraham Lincoln in the, in the room. Um, an original, one of the copies that was made of the declaration of independence because the declaration of independence is almost, you can't see it anymore. It's almost completely gone. It's faded. So they made uh, copies, I don't know, 30, 40 years after the original document was created and on animal skin, and we actually have one of those editions in the museum. Mm. So it's all contextualized with art from the time and going into contemporary times because we're really talking about the Constitution is such a founding document that has shaped the institution or the country since the very beginning and still is incredibly relevant and being debated today. So it is when people call it a living document, there's not much more of a living document that can right. exist than the Constitution. Does somebody own like the Constitution? Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> well, I mean, the U.S. government, we all own the original copy. Okay, but got yes, it. all of these other oh, copies these are they're well. held in institutions or they're individually owned. Mm. This is this copy is owned by Ken Griffin. He's the he's the lender. Big Ken. <laughs> <laughs> Big Ken just buying up constitutions. Yeah, and he's I I admire his um ability and willingness to share it with the it's public amazing. right away. It's yeah. super cool. Okay. So this edition. Edition, I, yes. I bought I bought a house and it's right there between second and I already I already told you this off the record, whatever. But it's right there. I'm two blocks from the entrance to Crystal Bridges. It's amazing. Which I'm super stoked about. Um but I'd ride my bike over there every once in a while, but I haven't because I'm living in an apartment because it's a dump and I'm trying to figure all that out. <laughs> yeah, if you go to the museum now and you look north out of the furthest building that we have, um, you you see a, a what I call a giant red scar across the earth. That's a nice way of saying it. That's the, <laughs> that doesn't, <laughs> doesn't sound so great. Um, I mean, it really exposes the rich dirt in really Arkansas. Is. Like You can't see a better example of than right there. And, you know, at those moments when you are in the removing and and cutting out the earth, it's cutting one of those moments where you're like, oh, my gosh, what have we done? Uh, and sort of your stomach jumps into your throat, kind of like, oh, no. Um, but you realize that it is incredibly important and essential to create this space of beauty in the future. And so... Um, we've got a great team that is working with the architects and the contractor to really make sure that we are treating um, the natural environment as as well as we can. In fact, when we started the first uh, the first part of the museum, the piece that's there now, we only disturbed about a hundred feet on either on any side of the museum space. So we tried to preserve it all. Um, as, as so that's why you see it feeling like it's so nestled into the environment. We're trying to do the same thing with this new space. But the reality is you've got to cut away the walls, um, that that ravine, cut away the walls of the ravine and um, start to set the foundations back in. So we're doing exciting things like pouring a sewer right now. <laughs> so that's really exotic. Then we'll start to see this building come back out. But replacing the trees and creating the environment because we are – that's what makes us special. That makes us unique in the world of museums is that we're nestled in this amazing Ozark forest. It's 120 acres and the connection to the forest is critical to who we are. 
I yeah, it's cool. Like it's it's. I mean, we're. I, I can't. You know, I'm the biggest fan of Bittenville there is. Um, you know, uh, but you know, you're riding your bike through this whole thing, and there's literally deer everywhere. I mean, you're literally in the country with a museum mm-hmm. and wildlife, yeah. which is not like New York City. And I think that that's what is for me that. I think if I've stood in front of anything as far as a piece of art, it may be just looking at that museum as a piece of art. And just recently, I sat on the lookout. I think mm-hmm. you guys call it the lookout. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I was sitting at the lookout, and I sat there for a long time. Yeah. And I I think that may be the reason why I really noticed it. And I was like, this thing is massive, yeah. and it is beautiful. And and um, is, is that um, – the architect right is it is kind of his philosophy that everything kind of blends in is it yeah in fact he uh, his dream is that it looks like this is sort of an ancient building that's being overcome by the forest it kind of does and so you can start to see that happen uh, with the existing building and that will definitely happen with the other so we planted really close like we want the outside of the building to age and look like it's sort of an ancient thing yeah but the expansion itself when you think about it it's a hundred thousand square feet yep so when we are thinking about that from a gallery perspective, it's almost uh, doubling the gallery space that we have today. So when you think about it from a visitor, you have that much more of an experience. And when you when we're done, it'll be about a mile walk from beginning to end. So you need some rest. So at the far end of the new expansion, we're installing a um, what I call a um, – a coffee bar by day and a bar bar by night. (laughs) It'll be a place for uh, a visitor amenity for people to rest and hang out and, and thinking about that the entire way. But the reality is we're going to lift out everything that we have in collection um, and reconstitute it, telling new stories and reinsert it across that whole platform to add, like I talked about earlier, craft, Native American objects, and even gems and minerals that you'll see in this new space. A lot of Native American art is lost throughout the years, and you guys are really making probably the biggest effort. Maybe am I just going to make this up? But I'm going maybe. to. But it's, um, uh, so is there what, anybody what, making a bigger effort to find as many artifacts? I guess. In, well, I mean, what we're doing is collecting objects that reflect uh, that are that will sit next to objects that we have now, so that they're in context with the work that we have today. Okay. So there are other other organizations that certainly collect Native American objects um, and tell those stories. But for us, it's about trying to tell a more inclusive, fulsome American story. So um, that objective would be to find the best works that are the highest quality that have the most expansive stories associated with them. So, yes, we're, we're going on that. I guess you'd call it a hunt, but really being very strategic about what objects come into the space. And then part of it, sorry. Yo, don't be sorry. I'm, I'm <laughs> is loving a, it. Uh, is a big new temporary exhibition space. So uh, if you've been into our space now, it's it's called Fashioning America, and it's kind of a very long um, space. And this new space will be a giant big box that's about 13,000 square feet. So it's a box with no columns, no walls, and we can go completely wild in that space for temporary exhibitions. So we'll double the amount of temporary exhibitions that we have wow. uh, when we open in 2026. And then underneath that is about the same amount, 13,000 square feet of space that's dedicated to learning and engagement. Um, And it's about creating space where community can come together, they can gather, they can have conversations. Uh, There's art making space, uh, there's studio space, artists and residency space. There'll be a small ceramic studio, um, a community gallery space, and and more space for kids to have lunch. (laughs) That's awesome. <laughs> Most important thing. People That's love right. lunch. Have you been staring at a music, a piece of art for an That's hour? That's right. You got to hungry. You, you got to get, get hungry. hungry. Yep. The expansion. This is something that I, I I hope that you can speak to because it's you know I'm I'm trying to get somebody in here that can speak to you know Alice has all these visions I guess like she I find her fascinating. Mm-hmm. One day, I'm hoping. One day. One day. I hope to. Um. But like this whole health thing. Yeah. Is fascinating to me. Are you part of that world too? Are you? We're connected. That's all in the ecosystem. So uh, what's exciting is all those things are happening on our campus. Right. um, And intentionally so. So um, that whole health and engagement is really about discovering the, you know, it's all about mind, body, spirit, and how we think about caring for ourselves individually. And I'm not an expert in this space, but what I'm really excited about is that connection between art, nature, 
and whole health. So I guess we should of- tell people real quick. Uh, oh, yeah. Just anybody that doesn't know what whole health is, Alice Walton has spent an enormous amount of money to start not only a medical school, but also a hospital that blends different types of teachings. Let me back up. Let me back you up. Let me back it up. Okay, back it up. You do your thing because I know nothing. So uh, you're right on the medical schools. So uh, uh, the Whole Health Institute is an institute that will work to um, help primarily um, systems and uh, um, practitioners with uh, infusing the idea of whole health within their practice. That whole health idea will also be part of the school of school of medicine as well. So the idea is to sort of advocate and bring about different kinds of thinking about how do we, how do we take control of our own health and how do we make choices that are um, broader than maybe a traditional medicine without removing the idea of traditional medicine. So that's that space and the med- medical school are very connected. And for us, it's about collaborative opportunities to connect about how do you create healing in different ways? Like, there's been lots of studies and tests around the healing power of nature and the healing power of art. And even I think the Canadians, uh, the Canadian health system writes prescriptions for visits to art museums for healing purposes. So it's those kinds of things that we are excited about collaborating on with that team. That's, that's, I mean, that's, that's like the out of the box thinking where you think it's ridiculous. And then for whatever reason it works. Yeah. Like I, you know, I was, you know, I, I know a lot of hippie, my hippie, hippie <laughs> friends out there in the world that are raking it up and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, I, I, I have fun with it, you know, like I'm, I'm not here to tra- take it too seriously, not too seriously, but people are affected by it. Well, people are in like, you know, I can't deny that. Like, I know some people that, I mean, could not be more conservative minded, like not believing in anything and then have done some things that have legitimately changed their life and i you know and i i for sure these people are not people that would lie because they're for sure yeah not the people that would believe in it and i don't i don't think that uh whole health is into too much woo woo right <laughs> so <laughs> the, the 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 concepts that uh are being developed are like they're very rational mm-hmm. and you just have to think about it differently and and mm-hmm. recalibrate your mind a little bit about where you go um, so it's exciting to see where that evolves and that that's a growing team and, and really enthusiastic about engaging there. Yeah. I, I think it's cool because, uh, I mean, I had some medical issues with like, even with my mom, the way she thinks about medical, if like her doctor says, take a pill, I mean, that's what she does. It's like, you know, there is no other way. Like, yeah. you know, this is the like, way, this is the way of things that need to be changed. Um, right, you sometimes know. that is exactly what needs to be done, but not always. And and the idea also with whole health is very much like the idea of Crystal Bridges is about creating access for all. Because right now, lots of people, your hippie friends, I'll call <laughs> them, have, have an understanding and access to that, but it isn't a concept that's actually shared quite broadly and doesn't have a great level of access. So the hope is that other people will have an understanding and access to these spaces, just like we were talking about, about art. And when it comes to open-minded and like broadening the horizons and the affecting of art, the momentary is a really yeah. interesting place too. Like, <laughs> like going from there, because now... It's funny, speaking of out there, I used to have a hairstylist that was forever. I mean, she was my girl. And I, we never really talked about her personal life. And I was going for like six years, right? And she was this older woman, Russian. And then one day she just, she was like, I go, you keep going on these trips. Like, where do you go? And she was like, well, I'm an artist. And I was like, how are you? And this was my first years of Hollywood. So, you know, I was probably in five years. So I wasn't you know, I'm still like kind of blown away with like, wow, this is crazy stuff happening in here. Um, and then she was like, I'm an artist. And she goes, I'm not sure if you're ready to understand my art. And I was like, well, I'm all in. <laughs> Tell me what it is. And she was, uh, I can't remember. It was great. It was bizarre stuff. I mean, she would, I feel like she would just like, you weren't ready. I wasn't <laughs> ready. And I, so, and I gotta tell you, like it took me years to kind of be like, oh, but I was super interested that she flies all the way to like Sweden for like a month. And then just kind of like, like, I mean, I forget it was ridiculous stuff. <laughs> like she would just her. sit there with broken glass naked, like in a room, like just, and I can't remember what it was. It was something that ridiculous, right? It was like, and I couldn't figure out what she was doing, but it was to represent something or out of body and all this kind of stuff. 
I'm not saying you're seeing that at crystal uh, at the momentary, but a lot of the, uh, but maybe um, a lot of the, uh, uh, and I really started to understand through her that I think that this is kind of where I was like, this stuff is so bizarre. But then I was like, okay, it's affecting me. And there is something too of like, all right, it's not for me, but yeah, there's, it's making me think and all of that. I've definitely walked through the momentary and been like, what is happening over here? <laughs> like, what is going on? This is some strange stuff. Um, <laughs> tell me about the momentary. Tell me what, <laughs> what is a your great pers- introduction. <laughs> I'm sorry. Because it is, you guys, great. I mean, I'm sorry. I have no censor. I apologize. Yeah, that's Ron, okay. I, I just appreciate being able to talk about it. Okay. Um, so the momentary, if you haven't been, is an old cheese factory, old craft yeah. cheese factory that um, shut down and, uh, and was purchased and then donated to the museum, uh, to Crystal Bridges. And so it's all part of the same institution. So Crystal Bridges and the Momentary are two separate spaces of the same institution with very different brands, different mm-hmm. ideas. So the idea about the Momentary is really about dealing with uh, or connecting and, and focusing on living artists and the work that they do. Mm. And so when we think about the Momentary, and, and honestly, we opened for three weeks before COVID and closed – and have been in what I call the longest um, quiet <laughs> building phase that exists. So um, we are an organization that is focused on music, art, and food. If you think about it that plainly, um, we're going to become more focused on music. So I don't know. Have you been to a, a, a concert on the green? I have. So it's a phenomenal experience. It's insane it is it is such a cool space it is um, the coolest play i mean i i can't believe like once again i'm the biggest fan <laughs> i can't believe that like i could just ride my bike and you know just go over there and like all of a sudden there's a really cool all types of people are yes. coming i love it we've had a whole concert of grassroots or a whole festival of grassroots the roots are coming the roots are coming exactly there's, there's some incredible experiences that happen so We'll do somewhere in next year between seven and 10 big concerts on the green and those you should go to. There's also free concerts on the green yep. um, and music throughout the space. So we're going to get more heavily engaged in music. Uh, so when you think about the momentary, you'll first think about music as we start to show mm-hmm. you programming more and yep. more and more. And then you also think about uh, food. So food experiences that are happening that are new and engaging. They're communal uh, and so you'll see more programs that are related to food. We also have wellness in the space, so yoga and uh, what is it called? Some forest, not forest bathing, braving. Things. I'm, not gonna, I'm not totally good in the health space. I call in for my wellness health back here. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm over here doing some what, camera action real quick. Yeah, what, yeah, what, is, what, is, what are you doing over here? So, I'm over here. So sound are we talking bath. about the sound, sound bath? bath. Sound, sound bath. bath. Those are like, really popular right there now. There you go. Yes. Thank yes. My hippie friends. Yeah. There you go. That's so, what I mean. I used to not be into a sound bath, but now I tell you what, I will, if I can get my legs to cross, then I'm I'm all into a I sound bath. I jumped to forest bathing. That was the wrong space. Yes. Yeah, forest Whatever. bathing. I was like, what's a forest bath? Without cutting you off. Ron Those things are becoming that really popular. Even, okay. Yes. Yeah. Sound baths. So a whole wellness program. And then there's uh, also the visual art space. So mm-hmm. this is the part that's challenging to you. So you clearly need to spend more time in the moment. I need to, I know, I, by the way, I go all the time. I, 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 I love it. I, so I tell you, I go and I'm like, I don't know what's happening here, yeah. but I'm into it. Like, because like I, like you said, it provokes, it provokes a conversation. Mm-hmm. I'm yeah. a very open-minded kind of person when it comes to just like whatever. I, and immediately I'm okay with an opinion, as you can tell. Um, I have no problem being like, what do you think of that? <laughs> like it, well, it's, it can be fun. It can be like, I don't take it too seriously. I'm not going to be offended by something yeah. or, yeah, yeah. you know, it's like, I don't know what, what they're doing. I don't know. And then like, you kind of move on, but you, you yeah. had a fun time in there. I yeah. mean, it's, well, I think we're hearing that from people. We're hearing that it's hard to step into that space. So we're uh, sort of reevaluating that visual arts space to create a space that is maybe more comfortable for, for, for people. They relate more to the work. And so you might see a shift in what we're doing in that okay, space. All right, all right. We're working on that right now. So we still want to engage in living artists, um, but you may see a little bit of a different feel in 2023 as we move through the year. Okay. And then don't forget about the rooftop bar. Well, well that, I was going to, it was there. on the tip of my thing. Cause let me tell you, I am, I can't, we, we shot part of the movie in there. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. good. Which was really great, and I actually got to be the locations person on that. So oh, now cool. everybody over there thinks I'm somebody. <laughs> um, so when I walk over there, I'm that's like, exactly what you they're, need. They're, they're like, 
you know you're part of our institution now <laughs> just because like i guess they because i was part of the movie and like i became friends with everybody over there so now i have to go back because i yeah. like when people like me um <laughs> it really makes it easier on. to go back <laughs> it's like, I'm real easy like oh you like me you know my name oh let's go again uh, but it is one of the coolest most it beautiful is. bars and the fact that it i mean it still is a city little town and to know there's like a 360 it's beautiful and it's totally unexpected in my mind like you go into the momentary and it's it's pretty much an industrial space mm -hmm. outside and in um and you'll see some of those changes too we're adding more color and more softness to the spaces inside and out but but the building is an industrial cheese factory and then the architects wheeler kearns architects out of chicago said you know we're going to place this very cool space on the very top of this already tall building and we're going to make it inspired on uh, from a sort of 1950s or 60s airport lounge. And oh, it, so is, it is an airport lounge. It is. That's so we, where the inspiration comes from. Oh, yes. that's really funny because so it totally looks like an airport key. lounge. It's yes. really funny. So it is this very sort of plush, beautiful space that looks totally different than the other space. So I would encourage if you haven't gone to the rooftop bar at the momentary, you should go. Oh, it is I, a must I, visit. It's a must visit. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know. And it is the tallest bar in all of Midwest no. Arkansas. Yeah, it, it, which is so funny, right? Like I get <laughs> super excited about all that. I it's hear like the I hear things are going up around here, which yeah, is super interesting. You might have to add another bar on top yeah. of the bar. But it's uh <laughs> yeah, and um not that I'm promoting drinking, but their old fashions are amazing and as well as their espresso martinis. Logoed ice cubes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, logoed. I thought you said loco. No, <laughs> no. And I was like, the rod is into branded the, ice cubes. The for, forest baths and the loco ice cubes. Okay, <laughs> sound baths and logo ice cubes. Okay, no. yes, I saw the logo. The drinks ice cubes. are great. They're the very cool. Great. It is such a cool concept that is like a craft facility that yeah. was transferred. You know, the first time I went there was two weeks ago. Believe it or not, I'm local. I don't know why it took me so two long. Two weeks ago, my girlfriend works at the Tower Bar, so it made it <laughs> a lot easier to show up. Yeah. <laughs> so I showed yeah. up to the Tower Bar and I walked down that little hallway. Way that's obviously still in its phase of being uh, transferred into what it looks like at the top. Yes, exactly. it was so jarring. I was like, "Man, where am I at right now?" Yeah. I took the elevator up, and it felt like I was in the top of the top lounges in the world. Like it was incredible. Yeah, I love the endorsement. Very, exactly how you're supposed to feel. Very transported cool. to another space. It really was. And time. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. It was very neat. So neat. yes, we are. We we're working hard to connect with the community at the momentary, but. Um, yeah, and it's also not constrained to necessarily American artists. That's the difference right. between Crystal Bridges and the momentary spaces mm. is the momentary will engage with interna international artists as well. Mm. It's more of a broad scope rather than the American art yep. that the Crystal Bridges is. There. Very yep. cool. Yep. Very and cool. I'm not going to be stupid and do the whole thing like I don't know. Um, but I, I, I did for a long time want to know why it was called the momentary. And oh, I yeah. thought there was like this going to be this huge like – I don't know, but it's that the art is only there for the moment. Every and every opportunity is probably a different moment in your life, so it should oh, be changing all the so time. It does get a little deeper than <laughs> it, does. So it does. The <laughs> idea is that um, an, a different experience is is occurring every time you go. That's so it's, it's of the moment. Why I go. Yeah, that's kind of yeah. why I go. Yeah. It just must be fascinating, I think, to be in this town and see. For me, only being here for a year and a half, the difference in this town and how it's changed in just a year and a half is mind blowing. And I feel like the speed- oh, just a year and a half, yeah. Huh? Just a year and it, a half. Just a year and a half. And, and and I could be making this up, but I, I feel like this change, like like the the moment, like Crystal Bridges 10 years ago, blah, 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 then all of a sudden COVID hits right when you guys were about to explode as a city. Two years later, I kind of moved here right, kind of right in the last piece of COVID. Yeah. What's it like being part of, the change, like being part of like, like this town was just a little town that nobody even wanted to visit. Then all of a sudden the family is like, we're going to make this one of the coolest places in America, in my opinion. Um, and then just seeing people come here. I mean, there's just so many more people than there mm -hmm. was four months ago at Blake Street. Yeah. I mean, there's just, there's just a lot of things happening. What do you see now? What do you see? What's, what have you seen? And like, what do you expect to see yeah. in the future? Well, I think about it uh, as exponential growth. And so it's this is not sort of a steady growth. This is like exploding growth. And I, I am so excited about how we play continue to play a role in that growth. We, we never talked about when we're going to open the expansion. It's 2026. Oh, there we go. So by that time, like we have 
we have anticipated about 600,000 visitors coming to Crystal Bridges uh, this year. Mm. And we expect to be at a, like 1.2 million visitors uh, in 2026. And about 40% of our visitors now come from outside the state of Arkansas. Mm. So we're drawing people from all over the country, all over the region to come visit this space. And mountain biking helps and the culinary scene helps and just the friendliness of this community helps to it's, it's the nicest it's, place it's, in the world. It's a crazy, it's the crazy, wonderful place. thing. Being able to continue to inspire the future in this space and and be a place, you know, we're a place where people come to re, to recruit others to come here. There, that is something we do all the time. We entertain people and we engage them. And so, being a part of it is just it. It uh, inspires you to just do more and do better all the time because to keep up with the pace of this place, we've got to continue to grow with it. So. Mm. And if we sit still, we will die on the vine. And so having this community infused with us, I love the idea that this community owns the museum and that we have owners every in every part of Northwest Arkansas and every part of the country. But this, this um, is a space, I think unfortunately Arkansas gets a bad rap outside of Arkansas. Right. And I think we've been a part of creating a sense of pride for mm-hmm. this state and this community. And I think if we can continue to make this te- this community pride, proudful, proudful, <laughs> <laughs> proud, um, that's then we're doing our job. Well, I personally think you're doing a great job because I wouldn't live here if it really wasn't an inclusive place and it really wasn't a place of like where I felt like people weren't just, I mean, this is truly the nicest place I've ever been. It and is. It's been a- Truly, like, seeing how welcoming people here and, like, Blake Street even particularly, how wonderful, like, this place is to people of all types. And, like, yeah. so I think you're doing an incredible job, whatever that means, Damon Epps, um, you know, <laughs> from Damon Epps endorsement. But we'll you. take it. Yeah, I'll take it. You know what I mean? Whatever. I'm going to go. And now I have to go sit in front of a, a statue for an hour. <laughs> So, Rod, thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, I I love to talk about the museum and the momentary. It's it's the love of my life, and I'm super privileged to be able to do that. And I think um, you are doing amazing work just to bring a limelight on things that are happening. Well, here, thank so. you. I, I that I appreciate it. And you know, any other guests, I'm not going to lie to you. Feel free to let them know. I will. The good time show was a good time. <laughs> it was. <laughs> you don't have to be scared. I made some inappropriate things, but we'll edit them out. And people <laughs> won't ever know. Um, but once again, thank you so much. And I really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Well, that's our show. If you didn't get a chance to watch the episode, check it out on YouTube and Spotify. You can also listen to the good time show on Apple Podcasts or any other platform. We are always trying to grow our Planet Good Times community, so subscribe and follow us at Good Times Us on almost all social media platforms. This episode was presented and recorded live at Blake Street House Sound Lounge in Bentonville, Arkansas, a social club where people from all walks of life come together just to be themselves and make the community a better place. Till next time, good times, everybody. Good times, everybody.